Well, what could be more fun than talking in front of my favorite people? <laughs> um, thank you, Rosie, and thank you, Andy, for inviting me here. Uh, I think almost everyone here knows that um, I lived in Sonoma for 27 years, moved away 11 years ago. When I moved here in 1983, there, there was a bookstore, but there was no reader's books. And to me, this is my second home in Sonoma, and I think a lot of people so thank you. So um, I'm going to recognize two people who are in my book, and one is May Booley. And May is a character, a prominent character in this story, and my husband Bob Aker, who is uh, the dedicatee. So let me start with the name of this book, For Want of Wings, and that comes from a description of a, a dinosaur bird, Hesperornis regalis, that my great-grandfather found when he was 20 years old in Kansas. And um, Hesperonis regalis means regal western bird. Many, many millions of years ago, it was a creature that could fly, but over the millions of years, it lost the ability to fly and it became a diving bird. Um, so it, it is a creature of the late Cretaceous, 83 million years ago. So to give you an idea of 83 million years. If you imagine a penny is one year, and you cover a football field with pennies, and then you cover it again five more times, so you have six layers of pennies, and then a seventh layer covering three quarters of football field, that's 83 million. So this is very, very old. And um, so why why do I call it uh, a, a dinosaur? Why is that in the title? Well, Hesperonis regalis has been called the missing link between um, reptiles and birds. And uh, it is related to the Manoraptorans, which were some of the dinosaurs. Deinonychus, which you know from Jurassic Park as Velociraptor. It's uh, directly related to that. and. Manoraptorans were hand grabbers. If you can imagine those velociraptors, they, they eventually developed the ability to fly. And uh, so, enough about the birds. Um, you know, dinosaurs once covered the earth, and they're in the news every week now. Someone, someone has discovered another dinosaur, China, Australia, etc. But bird fossils are extremely rare, and that's because they fly and their bones are lightweight and very, very fragile. So a bird that survives the Earth's crust, um, lifting, settling back down, avoiding being eroded by wind and water, to be found by a 20-year-old who lived his entire life in New Haven, Connecticut. That's what this story is about. And uh, so I'm going to read uh, from the opening of the book to give you an idea of why I wanted to go see where Hesperonis regalis was found. Do something you've always wanted to do, something you've never done before, like jumping out of an airplane. That was the advice my doctor, a friend, gave me as I sat in his examining room after a routine physical. He had just told me I was going to live forever. So I asked him what he would do if he were me to celebrate a milestone birthday. I didn't want to jump out of an airplane, but I did want to see Russell Springs, Kansas, where my great-grandfather, Thomas H. Russell, as a member of the 1872 Yale College Scientific Expedition, discovered a nearly complete fossilized skeleton of a dinosaur that lived 83 million years ago. I thought it would be fun to take my 26-year-old daughter, May, my only child, with me. I called her and asked, how would you like to go to Kansas? I lived in Sonoma, California at the time, and she was in San Francisco about an hour away. The, the idea was a whim, and yet more complicated than that. It was the kind of idea that as soon as you think of it or say it aloud, you recognize it's coming from deep within. The significance of the trip would grow on me gradually and then profoundly. 
we began planning a trip for late October, two weeks shy of my birthday. We would arrive in present-day Logan County almost exactly 138 years after our ancestor unearthed his fossil there on October 27, 1872. That July, Thomas Hubbard Russell, whom his friends called Tom, had graduated from Yale and was about to enter medical school there. For the interim, he had signed on as a member of the Yale expedition, along with two classmates and one graduate from the previous year. Leading the party was the Yale professor and eminent American paleontologist, Othniel Charles Marsh. The contrast could not have been greater between the four amateur bone hunters who had probably joined up for an adventure and the great scientist, as serious a person in the field as there existed, and soon to be one of the most famous men in America. So that was the genesis of my going to Kansas to see where Tom Russell found the creature that's now in New Haven, Connecticut, in the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History. My mother's ancestors had come to New Haven in 1639 during the Great Puritan Migration, and I spent the summers of my childhood nearby there in Woodbridge, Connecticut. But the genesis of the book goes much farther back into the 1970s when I first saw this photograph of the 1872 Yale College Scientific Expedition in a magazine. And one of the men was my mother's grandfather. All I'd ever heard about him was that he was a surgeon and very reserved. No one seemed to find him particularly interesting. But when I saw that photo, I thought there must be something to him. Seated on the far left, they called him in a magazine the one with all the bullets. <laughs> they thought he was a local guide. Um, yeah. So, as I said, he was just 20 years old when he found this, and Hesperornis frugalis is an unknown dinosaur, unless you're a paleontologist, but it is one of the most famous fossils ever discovered. Um, at that time, in 1872, none of the, the big marquee dinosaurs, like Triceratops, Stegosaurus, um, Brontosaurus, also uh, all three described by Marsh, incidentally. None of those had been found yet. And so this was just about a dozen years after Charles Darwin had published On the Origin of Species. So this creature was uh, clearly a transitional animal between um, reptiles and birds. And so it underscored the importance of evolution and the validity of it. So Tom Russell did not become a paleontologist. He went back to New Haven, went to medical school, opened a surgical practice, was a professor at the medical school for 30 years. And then in 1916, he made a house call in February, and um, he contracted pneumonia, and he died. And his classmates and peers wrote uh, obituaries of him. They described him as a dignified and gracious individual a man of quiet courage and humility who is called in on emergencies beyond the ability of other surgeons. So two of his cases um, might interest you. One was a Yale student who was the grandson of William Tecumseh Sherman, the general. He was rock climbing with his friends when he fell and suffered a massive cerebral hemorrhage. And it was really too late to help him. Uh, another was a teenager an athlete who dived headlong into what he thought was a deep pool of water that turned out to be 18 inches deep. Mm -hmm. And um, he fractured a vertebrae, a vertebra, and the broken pieces were pressing into his spinal column, and he was in unbearable pain. And um, so they called Dr. Russell, and they said, uh, he said, well, we'll need to operate. And they said, but this sounds very dangerous. Um, he could die. And he said, if I don't operate, he will surely die. And so he operated, and the surgery was considered a success for a while, but there were just too many other things wrong at that point. He lived a few days, and the pressure was relieved, but he, he did not make it. So these are stories I found in newspapers, because my family didn't talk about him. They didn't find him particularly interesting. And they never mentioned the dinosaur. So fast forward to 2009, and I had published a book, Finding Pete, 
and uh, back then authors were actually going on uh, book tours and um, so I was going to be in Connecticut and I had been corresponding with a vertebrate paleontologist at Yale and he said if you ever come this way let me know and I'll show you the fossils your great grandfather discovered. So um, I did that, I went to the Peabody and Dan Brinkman had, had laid out on big tables all of these fossils and um, my first thought was they look like white truffles. They were big, <laughs> white, knobby, knobby things. And um, without asking, I just picked them up. And I think you're supposed to wear white gloves. But anyway, um, I picked them up and looked at them. And there were scraps of paper on which he had written things. And seeing these tangible objects that he had held in his own hands, uh, the, the story became real to me at that point. Um, so I asked the paleontologist at Yale, do you know of anyone who's hunting dinosaurs, or excuse me, hunting fossils in Kansas? And he said, no, but I know a guy there, and he really knows the area very well. So I contacted that guy and said, my daughter and I are coming. Uh, could you show us around? He wouldn't let me pay him, and uh, because he just loves looking around, <laughs> showing fossils to people. So. Um, when, when I looked at this place on Google Earth, there was nothing there. There was not a shopping center, there's no post office, there's no gas station, there's no housing development. It looks like it looked in 1872. And so off we went. And uh, May and I were both at this time at a crossroads. And uh, this, is, this is all in the book, the whole story, what the crossroads were, are going to Kansas, and once I stood in that beautiful fossil bed called Goblin Hollow, it was right before Halloween, by the way, uh, it was so beautiful and so quiet, and um, not really spooky, but different from any place I'd ever seen, and very beautiful, a lot of canyons there, and um, it wasn't long after that that I began to write about this and thought, maybe, maybe I have a book here. So <clears throat> the genre of the book is called narrative nonfiction, or it's called a, uh, a memoir by many. And uh, it is a memoir with a scientific expedition at the heart of it. I didn't want to write the history of that expedition, um, not a straight history. I wanted to tell a story about a discovery and a process of discovery and my own process of discovery and maze as well. And um, I wanted to take part in the story. And that's why it begins with a buffalo stampede. You, the first words of the book, you're dropped into a buffalo stampede. Because I wanted to signal that I was going to drop into this book all the way through it. And I wanted to get across my idea about history. Because um, my view of history is not academic. Uh, your life on this earth is history. And history is the story of people and what people have done and how things fit together. Like the quilt that's on the cover of the book, like parts of uh, a dinosaur fossil fit together. Uh, you know, some, we, we can't see it at the time, but in retrospect, we can see the, the pattern. And I want to say something about this time of a pandemic and a war, my feeling is that I don't think any of us are looking for a memoir that drags us down, that is painful to read, and just makes you sadder. So this isn't uh, that kind of story. I'm not a recovering heroin addict, <laughs> like <laughs> Cheryl Stray. I didn't uh, escape from a violent survivalist family, like Tara Westover. Um, this isn't that kind of a book. This is a journey book. And it's my invitation to come with me on a journey that I took. So I'm going to read one more excerpt. Oh, just a bit of context. So obviously none of these men is alive. Um, most of these men didn't marry or have descendants. So when people didn't leave a journal or letters and um, they weren't famous, um, how do you how do you tell a story about them? 
Well, you just ask all the questions you can think of. That's the only way I know how to do it. So I had this photograph. Uh, it's in the collection of the archives of the Yale Peabody Museum. And so I thought, well, who, who can tell me about this? So I went to a Hollywood costume company, um, interviewed costume experts, and then I, um, I thought, well, maybe a portrait photographer could tell me something about people in a picture. So that's what this, here we go. He has a lovely face, doesn't he? Don Bowery said. He looks very comfortable, very relaxed, calm, or determined. Don and I were sitting in the warm sunshine of a February morning in Los Angeles. She is a British photographer who now lives here. We were studying Tom Russell in the photograph of the 1872 Yale expedition. I had found Don by Googling best portrait photographer in LA, an, an honor that voters in the 2018 LA Hot List contest accorded her. I wanted to show the photograph to a professional who works behind the camera and could tell me what she saw in the seven subjects' faces. I thought a portrait photographer might offer an insightful perspective on the men. When I asked if she would take a look at the photograph, she suggested we meet for coffee at the Canyon Country Store in Laurel Canyon. This neighborhood in the Hollywood Hills is famous for the musicians who lived here in the 1960s and 70s. The composition of the photograph was good, Dawn said, as she studied the image. It was very natural. Marsh, standing in the middle, was clearly the leader. When a group or a family is photographed, she said, you usually see how they're connected. Here, the only persons connected physically were Benjamin Hoppin and Charles Hill. Hill's hand is resting on Hoppin's shoulder. Wondering if that were a sympathetic gesture, I asked if Hoppin looked like he had recently undergone a traumatic experience. I told Dawn about the night he had spent under a buffalo hide, lost on the Kansas plains. She didn't read anything in his facial expression. Pointing to James McNaughton, she said, this one looks like a handful. In Kansas, he had collected only one fossil, a specimen of a marine lizard. He also found a rodent fossil, but not until the party reached Colorado. Don pointed out that the other students were leaning back, but Tom was leaning forward. Tom is ready. He's prepared. I thought about the obituary his colleague, Dr. William Hawks, wrote. He described Tom as so prepared for his work that he routinely carried with him an armamentarium of surgical instruments. He's confident. He's self-assured. Don placed an index finger on Tom. If I'm going on an expedition, he's the one person I'm going with. He's smart. He's ahead of his time. He's adventurous and trailblazing, but it was all internal. He was not shouting and bragging about. Looking up from the notes I was taking, I noticed a man sitting at a nearby table. On the bench beside him, a big dog, sitting stock still on all fours, was observing me with intense interest. The animal's forelegs stretched straight ahead like the sphinxes in my direction. Are you looking at me? I asked the dog. Its tail wagged heavily from side to side. I love dogs, but this was a pit bull, a breed I'm a little afraid of. You are looking at me, aren't you? I said. With its entire body now wiggling, the sphinx pushed its paws closer to me. The owner held the leash. I asked the dog's name. Mama, the owner said. <laughs> <laughs> he had rescued her at five months. Does she know you saved her life? I asked. Yes, he was sure she did. Her coat was shiny and the same color as the Weimar honors who lives across the street from me. Mama was a loved dog. She was named for Mama Cass of the Mamas and the Papas, who had once lived in the basement of the store where Dawn and I, the dog and her owner, and several more regulars were all enjoying the warm winter day. Laurel Canyon was the home of Joni Mitchell's ladies, who wore gypsy shawls, baked brownies, and sat surrounded by cats and babies. When Joni came to Los Angeles in 1968, a friend told her about a book he found in a flea market. It said the craziest people in America lived in California. <laughs> the craziest people in California lived in Los Angeles. The craziest people in Los Angeles lived in Hollywood. The craziest people in Hollywood lived in Laurel Canyon. The craziest people in Laurel Canyon lived, out, lived on Lookout Mountain, so she bought a house there. <laughs> Lookout Mountain Avenue intersects Laurel Canyon Boulevard, where Dawn and I sat, sat drinking 
and Mama flirted with me. In the course of learning about Tom Russell and the 1872 Yale expedition, I had come to understand the importance of chance meetings and unexpected intersections. They often shape history, and I was alert to them. Here I sat on a sunshiny day at the literal intersection where some of the most influential music musicians of the late 1960s and early 70s met. It was also the intersection, figuratively, of a music mecca, a friendly dog, a 19th century photograph, a portrait photographer, and, well, me. Jim Morrison, the lead singer of The Doors, lived in a house behind the store and supposedly wrote Love Street there. Glenn Fry of the Eagles said in a Vanity Fair interview that on his first day in Southern California, he drove to Laurel Canyon. The first person he saw standing on the porch of the Canyon Country Store was David Crosby of Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Jennifer Aniston worked the cash register and made sandwiches here. Canyon residents, visitors, and more celebrities than one can count hang out here for the artist vibe and the espressos served at a cart on the patio. It was all internal. As I drove home in the slow-moving traffic of a Los Angeles afternoon, I thought about Dawn's words as she studied Tom Russell's face. What is a man like who is internal? All right. Yeah. So, um, any questions? Janet? Well, it's a trivial one, but I know the family name is Russell, from Russell, Kansas. And it's, isn't that where Bob Dole is from? And I just wonder if your family, you know, somehow, the town is named for your family. My family is not from Kansas. They're all from Connecticut. And uh, my mother's family came to, to Connecticut, and I have relatives who've never been west of the Hudson River. My dad's family came early. They settled in Massachusetts. But Russell Springs is not named for anyone I'm related to. Um, it was named for a, a Civil War veteran who was killed in Arkansas. So no, I'm not connected to Bob Dole. <laughs> <laughs> but Russell is a very common name, as you know. Alan? Um, what was it like to look at the fossil? I mean, could you see something there? I mean, is it that obvious? Could I see that it looked like? The bird. Uh, no. They, the, they have it mounted in the museum in a standing position. Well, it couldn't stand. It, it really moved like a walrus. And um, as I said, it couldn't fly. So it looks more like a bird than a lizard. The, the telltale thing is the big jaw with the teeth. Well, if you can visualize a penguin, it's about that size. And it, because its wings had atrophied, it had become over millions of years a very good diving bird. And its food was mainly fishes. And you may know that um, at least half of the present United States, the continental US, was covered in an ocean millions of years ago. And um, so it lived on the shore, and it dived for fish. <laughs> they look like no. train robbers or something. <laughs> Funny you should say that. They've been misidentified. This is considered an iconic photo of the West. Uh -huh. And it's been, it shows up a lot of places. I was uh, at a museum in Bend, Oregon, and this photo was there. And people just, um, they just thought they were a bunch of Western guys with guns. Yeah. Heavily armed, they didn't know. And so the only one who is a paleontologist actually a trained geologist, because there was no science of paleontology uh, at that time, is standing in the center. And that's the, the famous um, O.C. Marsh. And if any of you have heard of the Bone Wars or maybe seen that special on, on TV, he was one of the two who were feuding throughout the Bone Wars. But he was the, he, he was, uh, the more educated of the two, and he founded the paleontology department at Yale. He had a very rich uncle who built the museum, gave him a teaching job, and funded his education. And then the four younger men seated are these recent Yale graduates of the class of 1871 and 72. Jenny? I wonder they're dead. Oh. Um, George Bird Grinnell, the, the famous naturalist and con conservationist 
believes that they were given free passes on the railroad to travel. And then Marsh was very well connected, and so he knew a number of generals who wrote letters of introduction for him that he took along the way. And um, so, and some of the students who, there were four expeditions in all. This was the third of them. And some students say that they were expected to pay for everything, including the, the fossils that they shipped back to New Haven. That, and you know they were extremely heavy and filled many boxcars. Well, one student said he had to pay for those himself. And um, I'm not sure. Marsh financed uh, a lot of the first one. I'm not sure about the subsequent. And I'm not sure because there are differing accounts of that. But my great-grandfather's father um, was not, uh, not a robber baron type, not a wealthy man. He ran a very prominent school in, in New Haven, Connecticut. And it was very well known. It was a military style prep school. And um, so, you know, as a school superintendent, is, is that the way to a great fortune? Probably not. Excuse me. Yes. It was a picture taken in Connecticut. It was taken in Denver. And that was one of the mysteries I had to solve because even at the Peabody Museum, they didn't know who took it or where. And I, as I said, um, there weren't a lot of sources about this, so I just had to ask questions and go to everybody I could think of. And I, um, I managed to find out where it was taken and by whom because I went to um, a curator at the Huntington Library near where I live. And um, she's an expert in old handwriting and in photography. And um, so she had an assistant who loves a problem. And um, the assistant, we had a lot of conversation. I told her everything I knew about the photograph. And then she said, I think I've seen that carpet somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and because the first question was, was this an itinerant photographer who was traveling from fort to fort? There were a lot of those, hundreds. And um, and so this, the the curator said, no, this is an indoor studio. Um, and she pointed out certain things, how the light was falling on them. She said, no, this, this is a studio uh, uh, mm -hmm. image taken. So anyway, then she said, I think I recognize that carpet. So when she told me that, and she sent me something with a similar carpet, I noticed that the background, those, those aren't just water stains behind the standing men. That was actually what would you call it, the thing that drops down? The backdrop. I recognize the same backdrop. So I said, ah, OK. William Gunnison Chamberlain took it in Denver in 1872. Well, OK, so the idea of, of history. Um, some of us probably know Jim Rawls, who is a California historian here, uh, and a, a great historian. And, but he, he is an academic, and I'm not. Um, so I, the more I thought about history and the way I wanted to tell it, um, and the more I talked to people, people were saying, you know, my life is so connected with things, it didn't turn out the way I expected. Um, and then I just began to think, well, that's, that's really what I think history is. So, um, and I think most of us, when we look back, we, we realize that a lot of the things that set us on our way were accidents or they seemed like accidents. Now, I'm a descendant of Puritans who didn't believe in accidents. Um, but um, that, that's how I see it. And, and uh, it's, all, it's all about people and the choices we make and the people we run into. And um, you know, the person we're seated beside at a dinner party, and we wind up marrying him. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I was just curious, like, how many years of dog research does this book represent? Because it's so, I was blown away by the amount of work you must have had to do mm -hmm. to track all this stuff down mm -hmm. and piece it together. Oh. Um, maybe I, I might have started thinking about it <coughs> 10 or 11 years ago, but not realizing it was a book. Yeah. and. Um, I, I was a book editor, so I didn't I didn't know. And then I was working on other editing projects and doing some writing for a, a winery in 
near Santa Barbara, and um, <coughs> really just thinking about this, I, I, there were so many different elements. There was Kansas, there was Connecticut, there was Sonoma, there was May and 350.org. For those of you who don't know May, she is uh, one of the founders of a climate organization called 350.org, which she and her friends started in college and now is a global um, campaign. So how I was going to pull this together, I, I really didn't know. So I just had to take my own advice and just keep writing. But then when, when everything closed down because of the pandemic, I just breathed a big sigh of relief <laughs> because everything was quiet now and I could finish the book. And so I did that, and then I um, I sent it off to one publisher, and uh, and they took the book. <laughs> 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 